as we get to the present and try to understand how this can be unraveled, I just want to say how thrilled I am that the administration, President Obama and Secretary Kerry, have chosen to make this a major focus of the work of this administration in foreign policy. Let's face it, American administrations have not exactly always given Africa the attention it deserves, in particular in this region. I see this as a major departure. I've spoken to the President about it personally. I've spoken to Secretary Kerry about it several times, and in fact, uh, he chose, uh, on the occasion of his first time as presidency, President of the Security Council, all the topics he could have chosen, Lord knows there are so many, this is the topic that he chose to make the subject of that Security Council meeting in July. I think that was an important step to signal the American involvement. I said to the Secretary as he asked me if I would take on this assignment, because I knew sometimes these assignments are part-time, people take them uh, as one of their things they're doing. I said, are you looking here for me to do this part-time or full-time? He said, full-time. This will be your job. This was the decision of the Secretary, and I'm extremely pleased. This is just a difficult thing that you're doing anything else at this point. Uh, this is such an all-consuming and challenging position that that was a sign of the Ambassador Carson sort of made sure I didn't have to go through all the sort of good news aspects of the international, uh, signs of international commitment to this that occurred uh, in the last few months. But to remember is that the M23 rebellion and the response to the M23 rebellion with regard to the uh, initiation of the Kampala process by President of the Seventh United preceded the framework of your agreement of last bit. I think people sometimes forget or conflate the two processes. They are different processes. The process of trying to resolve the conflict between the DRC and, and the M23 preceded this, and those talks have, have preceded. And then the framework agreement, of course, which is intended to deal more fundamentally with the problems between the nations and groups involved, wasn't signed until February. It has a much broader agenda uh, and uh, is they are very much connected to the role of UNESCO, the role of the special envoys, the fact that the World Bank has said that they're willing to put forward a billion dollars toward the positive and economic development aspects. So it's important to distinguish between those two. At the same time, I'm sure you will have noted that those of us involved with the framework, and supportive of the framework, decided to devote a great deal of time, more time than we would have liked to, to helping resolve the Kampala talks possible. Now why would we do that? Well, we believe that it would be very difficult to move to the broader issues and to achieve <coughs> the broader mediated talks with the actual countries at the table. If this particular problem could not be resolved, the talks have been languishing, uh, since they've been initiated last December, we made the judgment that if we could get the talks to conclude, particularly if we could get them to conclude positively, that this would be uh, an end in itself, resolving one of many, many issues, only we're good regarding one armed group, but a positive thing in itself <coughs> that would alleviate, I think, hope, some of the suffering in Eastern Congo, but that it would also be a momentum builder, a symbol of the broader possibilities that this region holds for us as we move forward. So that was the goal. It's been extremely challenging. We've been there several times, myself, my staff, and others, deeply involved in negotiations and, and the process in a way that we would not have expected to be. As you know, just after we were able to praise the Democratic Republic of Congo for being reasonable in one series of the talks, and we got to a point where much of the agreement had been finalized, or at least the initial. Uh, then uh, the conflict broke up, and the DRC had an exceptionally positive military result, working closely with Benasco, with the result that the M23 was essentially disarmed, and this has to be completely clarified at all times, uh, basically put in a very different position, much weakened or completely weak position than they were before. And then we still hoped after that uh, that there would be a signing of the document concluding the Kampala talks, and that is something that we're still trying to see. Having said that, when I went with the Secretary uh, to the UN in July, we had two primary objectives. One was to make sure that, uh, short-term objective, okay. one was to make sure that the M23 was dismantled. 
disciples. That is largely religion. Second, was to do whatever we could to urge external actors and states not to support the M24. We believe we've made progress with regard to that. But the two short-term objectives have at least preliminarily been achieved, but the most important thing to say when I was asked in Pretoria, what is your biggest worry at this point now that the rebellion has been renounced? I said, my biggest worry is that people think we're done. That somehow this solves the problem in Eastern time. Given the relative lack of knowledge about the problem, it's easy for people to come to that conclusion when they see that coming across CNN or BBC. That is not even close to what has happened here. And although we're pleased to make some progress and are assigned to the Pope, uh, this is only the beginning of what I hope we will all do together to help change what has been one of the worst situations the world has seen since World War II. So I'll leave it at that. Let me uh, start by thanking Senator Feingold for uh, an excellent overview of the situation. I'm optimistic. I'm more optimistic than I was when I took the job. Um, I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. I'm sure there are people in the room that uh, certainly do not consider the president or the president of these three uh, countries to be perfect human beings. I'm not perfect mm -hmm. human beings. But they're all people who uh, strike me as fully capable of being very, very rational actors for their country. Uh, and in conversations with them, it is, uh, it's an experience where you feel like you're actually talking to somebody who wants to make some progress in their nation. <clears throat> the other point would be, again, no, no one is perfect, but I think they are all somewhat interested in their legacy. I think they're interested in how a history might treat them because uh, they're all people that are very important figures in the history of their nation and the history of the region. I think that's hopeful. Uh, and, and, the, and I get the feeling they talk to each other more than we actually realize. So I'm not naive. I understand there are enormous tensions and rivalries and concerns, but I do see that there are interlocutors there, not only at the presidential level, but other levels in, in these countries, that allows us to have some real ongoing conversation, combined with the fact that the international community is trying to provide what I have termed sustained attention. That the experience in the past too often, in many places in the world, and often in Africa, is, you know, the rest of the world pays attention for a little while, but they are confident it will go away. Stop paying attention. I think the message is being received we're not going away, that we will maintain that kind of attention, uh, and that it could be a very positive thing. So I think that synergy between uh, those leaders in the region and our efforts is hopeful. Now, specifically on the important question of the uh, other armed groups and Monusco. We all know that what is happening here with Monusco, and particularly the intervention of the is potentially an historic uh, determination of a arguably different kind of a, a approach for a military force to the United Nations. You know, people debate exactly whether it's different or not, whether the mandate allows this or not. Fine. It's not exactly standard procedure. And the history of, of Monuk and Monusco and the UN operations in that country going back to all back in 1960 is not a pretty one. But a different story, a different book is being written here, and I would argue that Ambassador, the first two chapters are pretty good. And uh, I'm the president of the Coalition for Peace, Justice and Democracy in Congo, and also a member of the Common Front, a group of uh, communist leaders outside of uh, the camp. So after thanking you, my question is about what's going to happen now after M23 is gone since uh, Stephen Hayek had said when he investigated that uh, James Cabaret, the Minister of Defense of Rwanda, had told him personally that FDLR was not a threat to Rwanda. And then uh, I don't know if you know that some of the M23 uh, combatants were also members of the FDLR. So what uh, your attitude and the attitude of 
the final decision is going to be uh, about the FDLA and the other opposition groups. And also the, uh, the relationship between the Congo's president and Rwanda and Uganda, since he has never denounced uh, Rwanda or Kaka in terms of uh, what has been happening in the Congo. Thank you. Well, first of all, I look forward to meeting with more Congolese Americans. Uh, one of the other members of the U.S. Senate used to do that regularly as a senator uh, back in Wisconsin. Uh, but I realize there are national groupings and organizations I can benefit tremendously from that. I think the attitude uh, about Eastern Congo and the armed groups has to be that regardless of what the illegal armed group is, it has to be eliminated. And that the area that they used to control has to be uh, pacified in a way that allows people to live safely. That you don't just send refugees back to an area and say, oh, okay, M23 is gone, send them back with it. That's not when this was charged, that's not what the government, Democratic Republic of Congo should be doing. That's not what the international community. We have to make sure that the Congolese government reestablishes authority in all the positive ways that it needs to be able to do within those places. And the international community has to stay involved and in carefully monitor that. So there is no, I make no assumptions that the M23 couldn't come back in some other form. Obviously, had different iterations over time. I, I also, uh, thanks to the help that you've all given me, understand that just because a group might be associated with a particular ethnic group, that doesn't mean everybody in the group is from there, that the loyalties are uh, combinations of people are very complex. So if we make any assumptions based on the one group being part of one group when you join another group because let's face it there are other agendas here other than simply whether or not your particular ethnic group or country is being affected there are economic agendas there are other agendas that are deeply troubling and undercut the authority of the uh, government of the democratic republic of congo and the safety and the ability to live of the people of, of congo so uh, to me uh, even-handed approach that tolerates none of this regardless of the identity of, of who's acting uh, improperly, uh, sir. Senator mm -hmm. Sofengo, uh, you can uh, be affected to uh, collect feedback from the uh, request in regard to the meeting with Congolese. It's very critical that we have this meeting with you present so we can voice our uh, idea. We don't want to have a shooting fight. In regard to what uh, my colleague just said, uh, comment James Cavanello made regarding uh, the FDLR. Since they feel that uh, the FDLR is not posing a threat to them, will you encourage Rwanda to have a conversation with the FDLR as everybody has fallen apart? Second, given all the information you have gathered and the uh, proof that you have, Will you recommend to the President to apply the law that he has signed and he made regarding Rwanda and Uganda if they don't comply with the accord so we could move forward in this moment? Well, we've been very clear as a nation that if we expect the, the laws of our country that, that we've passed relating to this issue to be followed, and we've acted. We've acted on it the way that we said exactly an easy thing to do with regard to child conscription, with regard to sanctions on the M23. So uh, to the extent our law requires such action, to the extent the facts support that, we'll do it. Okay. It turns out that such conduct is not occurring uh, and that such violations are no longer occurring such sanctions should, and such punishments should not continue. It should be based on the facts. I don't think the United States could be said to have been shy or hesitant to say what we believe, even though it's not always comfortable to have that kind of conversation with a friend. All three of the key countries here are our friends. So these are difficult things. Remind me of your first question again, the first part. Of course, we'll have a meeting we talked about the UK. Uh, yes. You know, my view was it was sort of an exceptional thing, interesting, for the Democratic Republic of the Congo to agree to have the negotiations of the M23. 
I would not have necessarily told them that's something they were required to do as a nation. So my first choice is not to say that sovereign government should have to necessarily negotiate directly with, with rebel groups when there might be an alternative that's better. Alternative that's better is to have the countries in the region be a part of broader mediated talks that get at the variety of root causes of this conflict. Where it's not this rebel group or that rebel group at the table, but the countries. And that one of the top items on the agenda is their joint commitment, which they all made in the framework, to get rid of these groups. I think that's a better way to go after this problem than having each group do this. At one point at the time when these negotiators made it was pretty good at the negotiations was because the M23, and we, we observed these uh, conversations, and that typically the negotiations start 11 at night. Different approach. <laughs> so, 2 or 3 in the morning, the M23 saying the Congolese negotiation was incredibly polite and appropriate, saying, well, what kind of you know, political positions are we going to get if we stop this rebellion? But administrative positions. And, you know, Foreign Minister Raymond Chibanda said, this doesn't work real well for us. Anybody that wants to start a political party just has to start an armed rebellion. And then they get their list of their jobs and they're all set. I don't want political parties formed in this country this way either. So I, I worry about legitimizing uh, armed illegal groups that are illegal under the laws of the countries of the region under international law. I'm hesitant to do it that way. I think there's a better way. I think there's a better way. And that's what we're trying to persuade people to do, which is we're trying to see if African leaders would like to have that kind of a process where at the absolute top of the agenda is to is to make sure these armed groups are eliminated. I'm just going to finish the that. You're right. It's a different kind of process. It's not my favorite. We can, we can come back to that. We've got a question here in the first row. We have got now more than f uh, 40 armed groups in the DRC, including the FDRI. So to suggest that uh, the bad neighborhood between Rwanda and DRC was a result of the change of government in Kigali, it's absurd and vexatious, actually. It's, it's a result of the whole political process that happened in, in, in the whole region uh, from the independence up to date. Yes, then, uh, but I have a question for you. Let me, let me say we... we want to keep them short. Okay, okay. Chris, uh, you've had your uh, opportunity for rebuttal. So, but the question now for you, sir. Please. Please. Quick question. Yeah. For you, sir. Uh, because uh, Ray, uh, Ray, earlier on, you, oh, you argued that uh, some suggested that Rwanda intervention in DRC is, mo is actually motivated or justified on uh, economic interest on minerals. Uh, so, I just, put, I just want to put on record that uh, uh, before I start working with the government of Rwanda, I had an opportunity to work with MONUSCO, where I did my research on mineral resources sounds and like conflict. Sounds like a comment. Yes. <laughs> not a comment. It's not a comment. It's not like necessarily a comment. But I was astonished to find that most of the companies interested in mineral resources in, in Congo are Western companies, including oh. Americans, suggesting that, in addition of international community, the DRC yes. is no, not no. related to... No one should be allowed yeah. to explain to you... Uh, the resources of the Democratic Republic of I, I want to try and drag you a bit away from the DRC, but it's a relevant issue because it's been born there. And I think your comments on MONUSCO and the Intervention Brigade are very, very important, very pressing, very thoughtful. As you can imagine, this new phase in which peacekeeping has uh, moved into with a more proactive and muscular approach to, to peacekeeping. Uh, on the one hand, I think, I'm convinced, uh, has led to the success against M23. I think it, it's hopefully pushing the UN and peacekeeping more in line with the 21st century, with the discussion over the responsibility to protect, etc. But at the same time, we have to recognize that there are countries that have traditionally participated in peacekeeping operations that do so because they find it uh, a means to train their personnel, obtain